Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 441. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is September 28th, 2018. So, looking over the Anglican.inc website, there's lots of juicy stories to cover, lots of repeat corruption stories, lots of the Episcopal Church's collapsing stories, um, and George and I sit down and do a pre-show, every show, about what to talk about. And we come up with ideas, bounce them off one another, and George said, let's do a controversial story this week. I'm game, we'll do a controversial story, but let's talk about these other two things uh, as well, just so everybody's well informed and they don't say next week, hey, you guys never mentioned it. You know, that, that leads me to ask a question. If we don't report it, does it even actually happen? Ah, who knows? If a tree falls in the forest and no one's <laughs> here, it does it, did it happen? If you're and in the Anglican yeah. world, no, if we don't know about it, it didn't happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in China because it does relate to. Um, the Anglicans in an official way, but uh, more often uh, as a desired place to reach unreached, China's got the biggest market. Billion people over there, many of them have never heard of Jesus, never heard of the church, and it's as fertile ground as it gets. However, you have to deal with the Communist Party to get in there and set up a, a franchise, so to speak. If you want to do things officially and not have uh, your money stolen, your churches burned down, and your lay people harassed and your clergy harassed, there is a way to work within China. If you want to grow the church, you have to do it underground. Um, there's house church movements going on over there. There's an underground Anglican presence. There's an underground Lutheran presence. Uh, every denomination over there uh, has some type of underground thing happening in China. Let, let me interject here, Kevin, sure. so people can have a bit of historical. Uh, there was a Chinese Anglican Church, freestanding independent uh, at the time of the Chinese Revolution, right. with Chinese bishops, not just English and American missionaries, about several hundred thousand Chinese Anglicans. Oh, and through the late 40s to the early 1950s, most of the bishops wound up in the Chinese gulag. They disappeared into prison camps. One of them named K.H. Ting, this Chinese Anglican bishop, went over to the government and he was one of the founders of the official Protestant Church, the China Christian Council, also called the Three Selfs Movement. And officially, the Anglican Church in China disappeared in the 50s when the last bishop disappeared. However, those bishops who disappeared, they ordained other bishops and clergy and the church in China has survived, very small, very fragile, with unbroken apostolic succession from that church that was basically suppressed in the 1950s. Now, that's not official, you don't see them, they're not invited to Lambeth, they're not uh, at members of the Anglican Consultative Council, I guess they're not really Anglicans. Not really, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, we, but uh, th th this is the reality of the church, and it's also true for other denominations. Uh, and, who they, who they, who's, uh, who have survived uh, in the catacombs? And that's uh, the important uh, point here. The, the, the growing part of the church is the underground church. There is an official church. Don't the Anglicans have an official Anglican there? Yes, it's in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, uh, it, I mean, there is the Hong Kong Sheng Hongwei, which okay. is the dioc the three dioceses in Hong Kong: Kowloon, Hong Kong Island, and the New Territories. Now. That's not a particularly proud part of the Anglican patrimony. Why is that? Well, because the Archbishop of Hong Kong is a, is a uh, supporter of the Chinese government regime. He's a supporter of the crackdown on the pro-democracy movement. He, has, he says not a single word about the attacks on Christians in China by the state. He thinks the government's doing just a great job. And in fact, we can't complain uh, with a straight face about the Roman Catholics now getting in bed with the devil, because we're already we've been in bed with them for for a long time. We were there first. Well, let's talk a little bit about Pope Francis. Um, 
as we talked, there's a desire to reach the unreached in China, and uh, a lot of people do it the unofficial way. The Roman Catholic Church, through Pope Francis, have decided to do it the official way, to work with the Chinese government and having the Chinese help approve bishops to bring Christianity into China. Now, I see a lot of problems with this, George. Yeah, not, well, there are 30 underground, meaning not recognized by the government, Chinese Roman Catholic bishops. Mm -hmm. And there are seven bishops of the Patriotic uh, Catholic Association, which are Roman Catholics who have not been approved to be bishop by the Vatican, whom the Chinese government says are bishops. Those two groups are going to be merged. And in fact, two bishops who are underground are going to lose their jobs and be replaced by these patriotic Chinese bishops. Now, it's not also it's not helpful that on several levels. Uh, first of all, two of these Chinese Catholic Communist bishops have children, and uh, you know this celibacy thing. You know, it's well, not quite. They're not they're married, though. Let's let's be honest. They're not married. <laughs> they're not married. And the communist, you know. Cardinal Zen, the former Roman Catholic Archbishop of Hong Kong, is livid because he says, we're getting in bed with the people who've been persecuting us. And the future of Catholicism in China is basically as uh, as an arm of the state. We're basically becoming like the Church of England, well, which is not a good thing in their view. But if I remember correctly, didn't a Pope, didn't Henry VIII want something like this happening? Henry, this is exactly what Henry VIII wanted, yeah, and he is... couldn't get it 500 years ago. But Francis, in his wisdom, Boom. has maybe next thing we'll know, he'll say he'll apologize to the Church of England. You know, oh, big mistake, of course, the state can appoint your bishops, and I'll just approve them after you've done it. <laughs> this is, we don't know what the protocol is because it's secret. We just know it exists, and various statements have been put out. We've reprinted those in Anglican ink. What's, but what's it, the it, accord called again? It, it's a concordat. We don't. Um, okay. uh, the concordat between the Vatican and the People's Republic of China. Hmm. And essentially, what has been made known publicly is that the Chinese Communist Party will select the bishops and then the Pope will say, okay, that's great. Right now, in England, the Prime Minister selects the bishops. The Queen says, okay, that's great. Sorry. And the Pope has nothing to do with it. But that's what Henry wanted. Henry wanted the power, Henry VIII wanted the power that the Pope has now given to the Chinese Communist Party. And the second part that we know is that this new Chinese Roman Catholic Church, the merger of the two, will promote socialist ideology. Now the priests won't be members of the Communist Party, but well, they will promote the values and ideals of the Chinese way of uh, ethics and religion and sociology and all that wonderful stuff. You know, I think Justin Webb is going to be jealous that Pope Francis got socialism into, into an agreement before he did, but let's move on to other stories. Um, every five years, you and I have to, to tackle a, a topic, especially since uh, this goes all the way back to Tanzania, but the, there's always a, a meeting of some sort of a group of Anglicans called Lambeth, called a primates meeting, um, called an emergency uh, primates meeting somewhere uh, in some foreign country, Alexandria, whatever. And so the topic comes up amongst the primates. Am I going to go? Should I go? Will there be any result uh, for the furtherment of Christianity in my nation or in the Anglican Communion um, if I go? Because if I stay, I don't have to spend the money, I don't have to put out the time, I don't have to uh, rearrange resources in my country while I'm gone. Um, it's easier if I stay because I know what happens from going previously or having other primates from this province go, and there's just no result. Lambeth, although on paper we pass rules and um, things that help the communion, it, it just never goes anywhere. When we have a primates meeting, we get the the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury to promise to do something, but it, it never goes anywhere. Why would we travel there? And so this segment is called Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? Because there's a Lambeth conference coming up real soon, George, and Nigeria has already said what? Nigeria has joined Uganda in saying that unless Justin Welby disinvites the Episcopal Church and those people that do gay marriage and gay bishops, 
and invites the ACNA and the new Anglican Church of Brazil, they're not coming. They've given them an ultimatum. And the Ugandans have, all, have already did this earlier this year. So now the two largest churches in terms of Sunday attendance, Uganda and Nigeria, are going to be no-shows at Lambeth 2020. Um, and I'm not, I've not thought this through, but I'm not certain if this is a good idea or not. But, and it comes down to, what are the Nigerians and the Ugandans hoping to achieve? Because there are African ways of negotiating and doing business and English ways of negotiating and doing business. In, from an English perspective, giving this ultimatum basically means we're not coming. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, uh, you know, put up or shut up, you know, do what we say, and no compromise. Now, from the, the Nigerians are sort of like Donald Trump. They start out with a huge demand and then walk it back so they get all that they want, but it may not necessarily be their first demand. So are the Nigerians being Nigerian, or are they basically saying to Justin Welby, we're not even going to bother with this anymore? So I don't know how to read this latest announcement from a political perspective. From what I observed at GAFCON, I think GAFCON 3, the last one in Jerusalem, I think the old Western Anglican communion is just gone. It's not really something that uh, the largest portion of uh, Anglicanism is worried about anymore. I, I, there, I have not spoken to a primate in the last three years who really cares what Justin Welby thinks, who really cares what's on the ACC agenda, who really cares about the next Lambeth, um, because they know it's not going to grow the church. Uh, the men in, uh, that we deal with at the leadership level of the communion really do care uh, about their provinces and about growing churches, and they don't see any connection with the official uh, Anglican communion that helps grow that, George. And so when they say they're not going to go, I think it's just, we're done. You had your chance. And uh, every it's like uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy. Uh, every time you promise you'll listen to us, you make promises that you'll follow through on holding the Episcopal Church uh, accountable. You promise to hold Canada accountable. Um, right as we get to the, the last second, you pull the ball away and um, you start your promises again. And See, where I'm, where I'm coming from is in 1998, I saw this very clearly when there's a critical mass of bishops who are pushing for the orthodox way they get a lot of people on the fence to go along with them so the majority of american bishops in 1998 supported lambeth endorsed lambeth resolution 1.10 i saw jay walker the bishop of long island who was notorious uh, on many levels yes. uh, on this gay issue vote in support of lambeth 110 and the Nigerians and the Ugandans and the conservatives have the critical mass to basically get resolutions and uh, committee statements that endorse their view. Now, do they not want to do that? Or have they basically reached the point that it doesn't matter, we can come up with fine sounding statements, but then the Americans will go home and, uh, or the English, the Brazilians, or the Scots, or the Welsh will go home and ignore them and, uh, May make us look like idiots for investing our time and energy in this event. Well, or the, is this, they're not going to just make GAFCA in the future. Um, you know, if you're not going to show up at these events and you have critical mass on your side, you have size on your side, uh, you have millions and millions of congregates on your side, uh, that kind of enforces the role of GAFCA in all this. Well, yes and no, because GAFCA's major failing right now is communications. They're really poor at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and not just communications uh, in the form of newsletters or things like that, but inter-provincial communications. So every time we have a change of primate, uh, Tanzania, for example, or West Africa, Tanzania and West Africa, Justice Akrofi and Valentino Mokiwa were some of the founding primates of the GAFCON movement. Their provinces are not part of GAFCON anymore because the new primates moved them out. Uh, Tanzania moved back in, and then now there's another primate, and he is on the fence. He doesn't know where he is. But the point is, there's no communication uh, to the bench of bishops, to the mass of the clergy. So every time there's a new primate, there's a learning curve explaining why it's important that you come this way. And 
that's not a good recipe for building an institutional an institution that will survive beyond charismatic leaders um, and for my little strategizing it's important to have events like Lambeth so you can evangelize and rally the team because all the bishops were one place and they'll see it feel it trust the guys but if you boycott and only have your own GAFCON meeting you're never going to be able to bring over the people on the fence mm -hmm. because they won't have the opportunity to see and experience what you're doing history shows us the peer pressure of the Orthodox Anglicans does work mm -hmm. history indeed also shows us um, when those decisions are made they're not follow through uh, follow through <laughs> there's no follow through from the leadership of the Anglican communion um, so I can if Nigeria says we don't want to go if these demands aren't met I completely understand that if a different country says we're gonna go because we know we will have some influence I completely understand that as well so uh, I'm not telling what anybody what to do um, but based on history there's a reason there is a the should I say Kevin, go I, people I, I would I would push you there um, for instance the Gafcon right now is predominantly uh, conservative evangelical. Um, you know, the Sydney and the Nigerians and the East Africans come out of a definite churchmanship. There are other churchmanships that are orthodox and traditional minded, the specific I'm thinking of the Anglo Catholics. Uh, except for Tanzania, uh, they're not represented within the top echelons of Gafcon. And bringing over the Papua New Guinea and the Melanesian and the other provinces that are traditional Anglo-Catholic, it's not going to work on this current trajectory that GAFCON is taking. And so, and you know, the now you may say, well, why replicate the tensions that the ACNA has over women, for instance, within their primates? Well, if you look at Anglicanism as a church, uh, a universal church, as a one of the is a Catholic Church. I think it's a mistake to put too much emphasis on particularity. Particularity, you know, that's why AMIE is in England is just gone nowhere because it started out being sectarian and has spurned anybody except for the true belief, except for the public school boys uh, who, who, with the right accents who uh, think they the way they do. AMIE is not going anywhere. Um, and I, I'm fearful that GAFCON, unless it invests in communications, could be investing in conferences to duplicate Lambeth. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think the Lambeth General Office. But, I'll let, but, but, but I think. No, but Kevin, no. I guess what I'm telling him is allow Justin Welby to pay for it. That's right. You know, he's <laughs> going to pay for the people from New Guinea and all these places from around the world who don't who, who don't have the money to go to a GAFCON meeting. And then when you've got them in the room, then you evangelize and sign them up but until, and let Justin Welby pay for it or Trinity Wall Street pay for it. Well, this would be... Don't, a, don't throw away that opportunity to build the movement. I would say this is a great opportunity for uh, African nations and GAFCON uh, promises to get together and for those two weeks that are paid for by Lambeth have it a, a retake uh, England conference you know spend your time in the streets retaking England for Christ because the people on the streets there aren't doing it can I give you an anecdote from <laughs> Lambeth 1998 that to me speaks to the potential Lambeth 1998 uh, I, I was there and I uh, actually was working with the American Anglican Council at the time I was a reporter and I was also helping with their uh, uh, operation there, working with Steve Knoll and company, Martin Minns. And I can remember that the American church had a dinner dance one night, one of the free nights. And at that same night, the conservative movement held a prayer vision. And they were, the buildings were next to each other. And I went to the prayer vigil because I wasn't invited to the dinner dance. But you hear sort of the bop, bebop music, the rock music, and the clinking of glasses and the tinkling of voices coming from the American party. And then I see Keith Ackerman on his knees next to somebody from Nigeria uh, 
profoundly seeking God's guidance and wisdom. And it is in those encounters on their knees in fellowship and in unity and prayer that the church grows and is made alive in the lives of people. And it also showed the shallowness and brokenness of the Episcopal Church by their basically vulgar vulgarity. If if you don't go to these things, you don't have the opportunity to do that sort of thing to achieve that fellowship. It's that's my. That's no, my that's, that's a good attitude. Let's move on to our next topic. Part of what makes Anglican Inc. TV and uh, unscripted um, work is we have access to sources. Every day of every week, we get emails. Some people call us, some people Skype us, but there's a constant flow of information. Uh, if something has happened or is going to happen, George, I, Gavin, uh, David, you know about you know, it. Yeah? You know, Foley, uh, or are we going to talk about that 36 year old accusation against Foley Beach? No, 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 no. Okay. And so we, we have this general knowledge based on sources. So when all of a sudden I'm uh, going through uh, some news feeds and I see um, Justin Welby wearing a black uh, uh, cowboy hat, Cowboy Justin, I have to say to myself, is this from the past? Did I know, know about this? No. Somehow he snuck into uh, ACNA country without us knowing about it and showed up at an event down in Texas where they dressed him up like Howdy Doody, and I was completely dumbfounded. How do we not know this, George? Well, we sort of knew about it, but uh, again, it's a failure of communications. <laughs> the, the communion partners, which yeah. are the uh, conservative, remaining conservative bishops in the Episcopal Church, had Justin Welby and uh, Michael Curry come to a conference on vocations that they put together in Dallas. And Justin Welby, uh, you know, flew in, flew out, and nobody, Episcopal News Service, Nothing. you know, gave it a pass. And these are Episcopal, and and more, more time and effort was spent in Justin Welby's stop over at Trinity Wall Street, where he uh, he propounded the gospel of Frank Griswold, the plurformity of truth. Uh, that was the you know, But man, how to spend a lot of money to achieve nothing of lasting significance is a, is a really good. Wow, well, uh, I'm sure he helped his troops and he raised a lot of money by going to Trinity Wall Street because you know we know how Lambeth 2020 is going to happen. It's coming uh, out of the coffers of Trinity Wall Street like it did last time and the time before. Um, but what's really interesting to, to me is nobody sourced us. I didn't get an email saying, oh, watch out, Justin's coming to town. Uh, and normally we get something like that. That kind of surprised me. What didn't surprise me was he shows up in the Episcopal Church and the first thing he talks about is socialism and um, the, of, uh, the plurality of truth. And I said, yeah, he's speaking to his people. You know, he's, he's got them where he wants them. George, it's been a fun Friday. I think we got all our stories. We certainly went over time. I blame myself. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 441 of Anglican Unscripted.